Um, I don't know if there is a single most important. I, I think it, it needs to cover several things. It needs to cover you know, the pathways to get there. It needs to give us an understanding of how 1.5 is, is worse than 2. So we know, we know that 1.5 is worse than 2. We know the impacts increase um, with temperature. Uh, for s small islands, understanding you know, how they increase, how, how the impacts get worse is important so they know what they can do. Um, so it needs to cover adaptation, mitigation, uh, and the impacts. I don't think it can focus on just one. Um, and it needs to be, you know, it needs to give impetus to um, the facilitative dialogue under the UNFCCC. You know, countries, this is what's happening, you need to do more. So, so one thing that I think would be really helpful for the 1.5 degree report, um, and this was a bit championed by David King um, last year, was to at least have some components of the report that were framed more around a risk um, framework rather than the more traditional framework of looking at the standard future projections. Because as soon as you do that, you do start to see a rather different perspective. And I think it's a perspective that's probably much more useful for many um, decision makers, because at the end of the day, it is those threshold risks that they're wanting to avoid. And especially, it, you know, if you're talking about the difference between a 1.5 or 4, 2 degree or 4 degree future, and in many different cases, you see quite a different picture if you look from a risk perspective. And it's not simply, I mean, we're already seeing it in terms of some of the attribution studies that we're doing, where we've seen a very dramatic change in the risk of certain um, events already occurring with just the, the climate change we've seen to date. But the other aspect of looking at the, from a risk framework, which I think is critical to factor in, is the fact that many of the risks that we see are correlated in one way or another, either in time, because we see repeated storms coming through, um, creating greater susceptibility to certain types of flooding events, for example, or because we see correlations in between um, one particular event happening in one location and another that's correlated happening in a different location that then jointly have some impact, whether it's on, I don't know, European power network or whatever it is, some reason why they end up being correlated. And you know, as we saw in the financial crash, <laughs> If you don't take account of those correlations properly in a risk framework, you can completely underestimate what the systemic risks are. And so I think that that's one aspect that I would like to see addressed in the report because I think we'd be missing something in terms of properly articulating um, the threat if we don't include that. Well, I think the crucial thing that governments are wanting clarity on, in particular the small island states and developing, least developed nations who really call for this 1.5 goal, is much greater clarity from the scientific community about what the avoided impacts of climate change would be, which we would achieve if we hold the warming to 1.5 degrees as opposed to allowing it to rise to 2 degrees. One of the key issues in the build-up to this was a recognition that 2 degrees is not safe uh, it's, it's not going to um, prevent dangerous climate change for many parts of the world. And they, but there's also what's come out of this whole process is how little research there is on the implications of these very ambitious mitigation pathways. And I think that's the main thing the scientific community can give is much greater detail, uh, particularly about changing risks of extreme weather events uh, on the uh, differential impacts of 1.5 and 2 degrees. So I really hope that we get that information available in time for this report and that it isn't dominated by simply the question of how much harder it'll be to get to 1.5 versus 2 on the mitigation side. People need to know what the benefits are of going to 1.5 as well as how much harder it's going to be. I think what needs to be addressed for the IPCC report is focusing on those that are vulnerable. So those are particularly um, maybe countries in that are in lower developing countries or those that are maybe remote and can't get assistance in terms of adaptation on, on their own. I work in the area of sea level rise and this means um, countries that have got large deltas that are very flat and low lying, um, small island developing states or countries maybe that have got um, that are, are poorer and just can't adapt. Many of those are around the African, uh, including those around the African coastline. I think that what the world is looking for, or at least the governments that ask for the report, it really comes down to two things. First of all, can this be done, the feasibility question? Uh, and secondly, what's the difference 
between a world where we aim to achieve two degrees and a world where we aim to achieve one and a half degrees. What does the world look like? What are the climate impacts? What are the responses to trying to address either of those worlds? And therefore, again, what are the political, social, and economic reverberations, both in terms of what we need to do and what the consequences of trying to do it will be? This particular report, I think, will challenge the IPCC both in terms of its mandate and the boundaries and the parameters it has been given, because in some ways, answering that question based on existing science, on peer-reviewed evidence and empirical evidence will be difficult, because we are literally projecting a set of scenarios into the future that are untested, unprecedented. And so I think for the IPCC, it will be important to figure out a way in which it can both remain faithful to its mandate, but at the same time give expression to a series of possible pathways that at least can be imagined. And I think we are at that stage of having to imagine transitions that uh, at least in um, precedent terms we cannot point to right now. So to me that will be the key task that the IPCC has to figure out because scenarios, there are many. The great advantage or the great strength of the IPCC is to give it the authority that is rooted in some form of experience and validation but on the 1.5 target, it will certainly be a challenge. Yeah, I think that says the same thing. I think the most important chapter in the report is the chapter on implementation. So this does, this does take these quite academic pathways about how we could get there, and it turns them into the implementation about how we do. And I think trying to tie the actual concrete implementation around the mitigation strategies combining with the development pathway and the sustainable development goals is the really is the most significant contribution that the special report can do and it will be a big departure from past IPCC reports who really go towards that implementation? I think one part, of course, it will be the natural science, how we likely to attend and uh, what is the most important and vulnerable areas. And then second part is the how we can reduce the emission. So the mitigation is the most important challenges and the willingness of the countries, you know, UNFCC countries to mitigate that. A country where I'm from is Bangladesh, which is the most vulnerable countries because of many kinds of natural disasters, flood topography, sea level rise is a big issue, and uh, we're also facing the cyclones and other na floods, natural disasters. So this kind of effort actually to limit, uh, and this report will help us to assess the possible impact on Bangladesh and other vulnerable countries, as well as how we can limit the emission to, towards to attain this goal. So this report should focus on those uh, direction. So I'm very optimistic about um, our chances on climate change with renewables, for example, taking off in recent years. But there's still a colossal challenge to go in, in every sector. And I think it's what happens in the next 10 years that really matters. So speculative technologies two or three decades down the line may have some importance, but it's most important what we do with fossil fuel use now, energy demand now, getting off fossil fuels as quickly as we can. So the near term is the most important thing for the IPCC's report.